Welcome to Journey to the Stage. This is Brian Frazier, and I am so glad you've joined us today. The purpose of this podcast is to explore the journey the artist is taking to gain insight to what has shaped them. Before we begin, wherever you're listening, if you could subscribe or follow or leave a kind review, if you enjoy our time, that would be ever so welcomed. This is episode number 15, and my guest is someone who has been making music uh, that is very near and dear to me for decades. My special guest today is John Elefante. John is a multi-Grammy winning vocalist, singer, songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, producer, record label owner, and former studio owner. John was the lead vocalist for Kansas and several other bands, which we'll chat about shortly, and has a song on one of my favorite 80s movies, St. Elmo's Fire. So we've got a lot to talk about. We won't be able to hit all of that stuff, but um, and also, John has a brand new solo album out called The Amazing Grace. We'll play a couple of cuts from that. Um, John, welcome to Journey to the Stage. Thank you for having me. There's so much to talk about. And I said, we, like I said, we want to uh, play a couple of cuts. Now, I know your, uh, your brother Dino is a multi-instrumentalist as well. So and you guys have co-produced a ton of albums together. So music really must have been part of, of your early life. And what were you listening to early on? What was being played in your, in your family home? You know what, neither one of my parents are, are musicians per se, but my memory of them playing records around the clock 24-7 is very vivid. They just had music playing all the time. Mm-hmm. And Dino and I had the advantage of having one another. He played guitar, I played drums. I'm originally a drummer. Oh, okay. You know, we have pictures of us when I was five years old. You know, I made a, I made a set of drums out of some cardboard boxes. <laughs> And Dino made a guitar out of a piece of wood with some rubber bands. And, you know, you're just messing around, acting like you're, you know, really playing for real. And then one thing to another. And my parents bought me a real set of drums. And then they bought Dino a real guitar. And we just, you know, we we just started a little two-man band. That is so cool. Now, at some point, you guys moved to Long Beach, California. When was that? I think we were in New York till I was about 10 years old. And then we moved out to to a... My dad got laid off from where he was working. A lot of people got laid off in Long Island, New York. Mm. And so we went out west because the sister company that he was working at was in uh, Hawthorne, California. Nice. I grew up uh, right at the 605 from you guys in Santa Fe Springs. So that's uh, oh, yeah. old stomping grounds right there. Now, yep. as you started to develop some of your own musical tastes and things like that, aside from what your parents were listening to, what were some of the things that you got into? When I was really young, I was, I was, really, I was into pop. I was into the Jackson Five and oh yeah, you know that kind of stuff and Chicago and of course the Beatles was my number one band. Um, then I you know I started prog- progressing into rock as I got a little older, progressive rock and you know bands like Genesis and of course even Kansas. So, you know my musical taste is pretty pretty vast. I mean I like I like everything across the board, man. I mean I, I like instrumental music. I like. You know, I love Steely Dan. I love, you know, Super Tramp. I mean, there's just any good music I just love. Yeah. I, I, would I, say- like, I, like, I like melodic music a lot. I like big harmonies. I like, you know, interesting, prolific lyrics, sting. Do you pick up any of those influences in your music sometimes? Like, oh, that sounds like something I might have. I, I know sometimes influences can be difficult as we, as you write and, and do these types of things. It might be difficult spot where our influences are coming out but it, do you see in any way how some of those early bands early artists early writers have kind of played well, I, into no, what I, you're I doing think it, i think it kind of sneaks in and you don't even know what's happening i mean i don't i don't sit down and say okay i'm going to write something like you know this or that or right i'll plagiarize this or that but i mean you hear beetle influences and in a lot of the stuff i do and you know it's it, it, it's inevitable it happens to everybody yeah, absolutely. Now, at what point did you start singing more and honing your skill as, as a vocalist? Well, my brother and I hooked up with, when we moved to California, we hooked up with my two cousins who also have the same last name, Elefante. And we had, we had a singer in the band, a, a guy named George Morales, that was a really good singer. And his career started taking off. He, he, um, he was on TV a couple of times. So his manager said, he's, he's too big for you guys. I'm, I'm, he's got to leave your band. And <laughs> He quit and we didn't have a lead singer and everybody kind of looked at me and said, Hey, why don't you give it a whirl, you know? And I did. So it, it, uh, the rest is history, I guess. <laughs> That's actually, I mean, but what a great training ground, right? With your family. It's, it's, it's as safe as it could possibly be. 
that's well, that's I, I, used really to, my, you. I used to sing when I was a, when I was very young. I used to sing um, "You and I Must Make It." Was oh, it that, that Jackson song? Oh yeah. Um, it's called my name, and I'll, I'll be there. Oh yeah. And I, I used to sing it note for note, you know, as, as high as he did. Wow. And that was the first song that I sang as a lead vocalist in our band. And uh, I kind of just got hired because nobody else wanted to do it. <laughs> Mother necessity, right? <laughs> yeah. Now, when we fast forward a little bit, 1980, 1981, Steve Walsh exits Kansas. Mm-hmm. How, how is it that you found out that there was that opening and, and talk about that process of, of getting hired on with, with Kansas? Do you remember a band called Idle Cure? Oh, absolutely. Breakaway, yeah, sure. Yeah, um, Mark Ambrose is, uh, is, is still a really good friend of mine who started that band. Okay. One of the guys in his band came pulling up in my driveway because we had a little home studio. And, and we converted my parents' garage into an eight-track studio. Oh. And he comes running up the driveway and he says, man, have you heard? I heard on the radio that Steve Walsh left Kansas. And I'm thinking, wow, that's a bummer. <laughs> and he goes, no, 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 you don't get it. He goes, you could do that gig, man. I said, yeah, right. Like I'm, like I'm gonna get that gig. They're gonna audition <laughs> a bazillion people, you know. Right. And you know that night, I started thinking about it, and uh, my brother Dino encouraged me. He said, yeah, let's let's try to find an in if we could. I mean, at least because we had we had some some decent demo tapes together. We were shopping a record deal at the time. And we had an attorney, his name was Jay Cooper. And I called Jay and I asked him about the Kansas situation. I said, can you get one of my demos to those guys? And he said, well, yeah, that'd be easy. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, my partner, Chuck Hurwitz, that he represents Kansas. Oh, wow. So he gave a cassette at that time over to Chuck, Chuck Hurwitz. And about a week later, I heard from Kansas' manager, Bud Carr. And he wanted me to come up to Hollywood and, and meet him and sit down and do a face-to-face deal and see where I was coming from. And mm-hmm. that meeting went real well. And then I did an in the st- I did an in-studio audition, which was very, very scary because I can I'm imagine sitting across from Bud Carr, the manager of the band. <laughs> now, and how old were you? How old were you at this point? You're pretty young still. So. Uh, 22, 23-ish. I, I don't man. <laughs> I would have thrown up. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the studio with legendary producer Ken Scott. Wow. As in um, David Bowie, Super Tramp, Beatles, list goes on and on and on. The guys, Ken Scotts is, is, you know, he's one of the most prolific producers ever. And I did the audition and I thought I did a horrible job because I, I was, my knees were shaking. Oh, wow. I was so scared. Yeah. So <laughs> it made my voice quiver, you know, because I was, you know how it is when you're shaking, man. You oh, yeah. <laughs> Built in vibrato. <laughs> so I finished the audition and, um, Got in the car on the way home, and I looked over at Dino. He well, he was driving because I was too nervous. <laughs> I said, "Man, what'd you think?" He goes, "You got the gig." I said, "What are you talking about? I got the gig. I was horrible." He said, "It didn't matter. Those guys they they knew that you were nervous, and your voice fit the music perfectly." Wow. I said, "Man, you must have been hearing something different than I was hearing on the headphones." <laughs> he said, "I'm telling you, man. They they were forgiving of you know the they knew you were nervous." He goes, but I'm telling you right now, you got this gig. I'll bet you anything I own. And I'm like, yeah, right. So lo and behold, about a week later, I get a call from Kerry Livgren. Wow. That's huge. And then, <laughs> and then I got a call from Philly Hart, the drummer. And, you know, this was going on over Christmas, I think. And they were back home because we were recording Violent Confessions in L.A., but they had gone back home to Atlanta to be with their families over Christmas. Mm-hmm. And they said, um, first of the year, could you come out to Atlanta and, and uh, we'd like to meet you and, and play some of your songs and, and whatever. Mm-hmm. So I flew to Atlanta and uh, went to the rehearsal studio. And you can only imagine when I walked in that room. I mean, it's like, oh, man, you know, a dream come true is, is, is an understatement. Mm-hmm. And um, they didn't want to do any of their material. They just wanted to do my stuff. Really? That's interesting. So we started with one of my songs that was on Vinyl Confessions called Face It. Mm-hmm. And um, gosh, I mean, they, they had already learned it and they started it. And, you know, I hear Robbie coming with the violin. And it's like, wow, wow that's that sound. 
to one of my songs. It was like, it was unbelievable. That's crazy. And um, I wasn't as nervous then. They made me feel really comfortable. Yeah. So, you know, I sang through it. And then we, we did a couple more songs. And I think I spent three or four days there before I got a call from Phil. And he says, you got the gig, man. Yeah. So it was just, that's, again, the rest is history. Yeah, that's crazy. And, and I know you beat out some big names. I, I was reading that people like Sammy Hagar tried out for that, Ted Healy. I mean, these are some people with some power. I, I, I didn't know at, at the time, I didn't know anything about who I was up against. Right. I wasn't, uh, I just, I just never bothered to, you know, that probably would have made me more, more nervous if I knew Sammy Hager was trying to get the gig. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I would imagine. And at that point, I mean, Kansas, they're not a nostalgia act. I mean, you, when you joined them, you did um, much writing during your tenure with them. Uh, you wrote well, Play the they, were, they, were, they were looking for not only a singer, but they also wanted somebody that was a writer. Right. Well, which is probably why they wanted to play one of your songs. And uh, I think so. so. You, you did a, a lot of writing while you were there. Um, play the game tonight. Great song. I, yeah. I've listened to that song so many times. I didn't realize you'd written that one. Hit, hit number four on the Billboard Rock chart. Um, did, did your brother, Dino, write that one with you? No. That's a long story behind the writing of that song. <laughs> um, but, but Dino and I had a, we had a big hit with um, Kansas with Fight Fire with Fire. Yeah, okay, great I think that got all, all the way. To, I'm pretty sure it got all the way to number one on the rock charts. So we we definitely made a dent. Yeah. Well, and so you left. So what was that like? I mean, here you grew up probably like me listening to Kansas. I mean, they they were had so many great songs. What was that like to take the stage with that with that group and go out on tour and you're like, I'm the lead singer for Kansas. Was that surreal for a while like how did you know that what? It's, you know you know what brian a lot of people ask me that question and i give the same answer because it's honest i mean i was too busy doing my thing i mean i mean being a lead singer of a band like that's a huge responsibility right and you really got to have your chops together and i was more worried about like a quarterback preparing for you know a playoff game and i didn't have time to think about it i mean i really didn't have time to think about hey i'm the lead singer of kansas now it's like I had to do my job. I had to be prepared. I had to ha have enough sleep and I had to, you know, I, I took it very, very seriously. So didn't have enough time to really reflect on what was happening to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What an incredible experience. And then, I mean, really how serendipitous that whole thing was, because that's obviously where you met Carrie Livgren. You left Kansas in about 84 when, when Carrie left and formed Sweet Comfort Band with, with Brian Duncan. And I, and I, I wore Perfect Timing out. I think I still have that album at my mom's. That was mm -hmm. your first time producing something. What, what was that like for you then to kind of move to the other side of the console as a producer? Well, it was, it was odd because I, I, I never considered myself a producer. Dino and I built a fairly nice studio in Los Alamitos, California. And back of her, right? Yeah, I think we kind of fell into it by default, you know. I think because, you know, I built some notoriety singing with Kansas, people automatically thought that, you know, rubbing shoulders with us would, you know, would be a good thing, you know, as a producer. But I always approached producing like like a member of the band, not so much as a, you know, a, a producer sitting behind the desk kind of telling everybody what to do. I, I just, I envision myself being a member of the band and that, that's, that worked well for me. Well, and it really opened up an entire new path for you because right after that, you and Dina were asked to produce Back to the Street, etc. And that was really, for that band, was a, it was a real crucial moment in their own journey. You know, Greg Bowles had just left, John Schlitt had joined on vocals, and they really needed their sound kind of reshaped, one to fit John's vocal style, but really a departure from Beat the System, which was, which was so synth-heavy. Um, in fact, I've often wondered if you and Dino had produced that album, because the core writing is there's some great songs there, but production doesn't really do much for me on that album. But here you are, you know, working with Petra and stuff. What was that like? Because you, you were, you guys were with them for many, many albums and won some Grammys. With that was a, that was a rough one because we'd been hired to do the record without a lead singer. Oh, okay. And Bob said, "Hey, this this guy that used to sing with uh, Head East is interested in auditioning." So we brought him out to California and put him behind a microphone. I think he'd learned a couple of the songs that we already recorded and he was rusty he'll be the first one to tell you he was very rusty and mm -hmm. 
out of shape vocally. And but you know, each each day he would the more he would sing, the you know, knock the rust off. Mm-hmm. He would get better and better and better. And we knew he was the right guy for the band for yeah. pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. But I, I had to work him pretty hard. I felt bad. I, I beat him up pretty good. Well, it's funny you say that because I've read it. I've met John a couple of times. He's just a, there's not a sweeter man on the planet. He's just a, a kind and gentle soul. Um, oh, but I, was, I, I remember reading interviews with him back in the day and talked about how you guys really treated him with kid gloves. Like, so he must have taken it, you know, he, not as being beat up by you guys. I think he loved it. And you what know, a great we, album. Because, you know, we, we, we'd have some lyrics thrown at us without a melody. We're in there not only singing it, but we're forming melodies at the same time. Now, you guys, you and Dina were with Petra for many albums. And in, in my opinion, you guys really put them on another trajectory. I mean, the, the core writing was there. Bob Hartman, obviously a great writer, but you guys co-wrote a lot. I think you even, you know, played and I can hear, sometimes I can hear your voice in the background vocals. Oh, I, I, I sing a lot of background vocals. Yeah. I was just Petra's listening to Fool's Gold and I was like, I can hear a little John... <laughs> back there <laughs> um, yeah, it was me and I, I also played a lot of the keyboards too oh did you yeah now you guys i mean all the way up to beyond belief which was to a lot of petra fans really the high point um in, in their it's such a great album it's really their magnus album news now you guys won i think two grammys for your work with petra is that right three i'm looking nice. at them right now oh very cool <laughs> Now, during this period of time, you and your brother, you guys were working at really a frenetic pace. I mean, you were producing an incredible amount of albums, not just for Petra, but for a, a lot of different artists. How did you guys keep up with in that period of time? Because you, you were really, really active and just going full throttle. I think what helped is there was two of us. There were two of us. So as Dina would be doing maybe guitars with Petra, I would maybe be working with another band on vocals and and. Because at that time we bought this, we bought a building two doors down, and we built a studio B. Oh, okay. So we, we had two studios going at the same time, and it was I hate to call it a production facility, but we were we were mad, we were kicking him out, man. <laughs> you know, and and um, Mastodon, we were doing Mastodon at the time. I mean, it was, yeah. we stayed constantly busy. Yeah, I looked at the list of albums you guys did put out during that time period, and like, man. I don't know how you guys ever slept. So we'll talk more about some of these other projects uh, you guys have. I want to play a song from your new album, The Amazing Grace. Um, We're going to listen to the title track, which is a really, really great song. Let's listen to it, and then we'll talk about it on the backside.
been a while since you released your last solo album. What, what made you want to get back in the studio for yourself? You know, I hadn't planned on making a record. I actually thought that On My Way to the Sun might be the last solo record that I ever do, uh, that I ever would do. Is that 20, 2013? It's been a little bit, huh? Yeah, thereabouts, yeah. Yeah, that was the Kickstarter record. We did a Kickstarter campaign to raise money to, to do that record. I didn't really have any plans on making another record. I, I said to myself, look, if it happens and something comes along that, you know, kind of, you know, edges me into it, then I'll do it. And something did come along that edged me into it. And I could tell you about it if you want to hear about it. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. Well, right around when COVID hit, I, I can remember when COVID hit me March 9th of 2020. Because I had just got through doing a date in Palm Desert, California for St. Jude's Children's Hospital. And everybody was making the mad rush back to the airport so they can get home because they were starting the lockdowns. Oh, okay. But right before that had happened, I think it was early March, right around the 1st of March or so, Mm -hmm. uh, there had been a guy that had been sending me private messages on, I can't remember if it was Facebook or my email address, but anyway, he'd send me songs. This guy, Frank Boxberger is his name. Hmm. You'll see him in the credits on the record. And, And, you know, they were okay. I mean, not great, not bad. And he keeps sending me songs and each one was getting better and better. And I had a gig at the beginning of March in Scottsdale, Arizona. And then I had two full days off before I had to be in California for more shows. So because his writing was getting better, I thought, hey, man, maybe we should hook up, see if we can come up with something, you know, because I knew it was going to take it was going to take something from the outside, you know, push me into making a new record. So anyway, he said, yeah, man, let's get you a hotel and and, um, come to my home studio. Let's, let's see what happens. So I did, I got a hotel close to where he lived and I'd show up at his house the the first day and we really hit it off very well. I mean, we talked a lot, we worked a lot, just put in a couple of real long days and we came up with, you know, parts of songs bits and pieces but no you know no completed songs right but i had enough bits and pieces to take home with me when i got home after the lockdown to start working on some songs i mean i had about three great ideas that him and i had culminated and um at at first it was going to be an ep and it was going to be called the phoenix project Mm, it was it was was just going to be a whimsical kind of alan parsons deal and um he said to me, man, this is not, this, this is not the Phoenix Project. This is the John Elefante record. You know that, right? <laughs> nice. And I said, well, for all practical purposes, yeah, I, I guess you could say that. So we quickly changed it over to a John Elefante record, but it was still an EP at the time. We were only going to do five songs. And he called me one day and he said, <clears throat> excuse me, why don't we do a whole record? Why are we just doing an EP? And I said, that's a good question. <laughs> he said let's do a whole record i'll pay for it wow i'm like you're kidding he said no i'm not kidding what an offer so he became like the executive producer and quasi co-writer and um that's all the whole thing was birthed that's really cool and it, it's interesting sometimes some oh, somebody it, it, from outside it, it, of ourselves can kind of push us a little bit you know it's great i mean i don't like throwing around the, the term a god thing because mm-hmm. it's it sounds a little trite almost but it was a God thing. Yeah. You know, it was, it was, it was God's will for me to make a record right now. I know it was. Yeah. And no. um, it couldn't have worked out at a better time because everybody was locked in their house. Right. Gave you something to work on and gave you the, maybe a nudge or a direction. Yeah. Um, well, and, yeah definitely gave me a nudge. Yeah. Now, over the years, you've, You've worn a lot of different hats, um, singer, songwriter, musician, producer, label owner, studio owner. I mean, you've, you've worn them all. Which do you find? Father, grandfather. Right. Right. Out of all. (laughs) Right. What do you, which of those hats do you find to be the most satisfying? Obviously husband and father, but in the, the musical sphere, which, which of those hats that you've worn over the years do you find most satisfying? You know what, man, there's, there's nothing. Any songwriter will tell you this. And I would say we'd probably have to, a lot of, sometimes I give different answers to that question, Brian. Mm. But what comes to mind for me right now is when you start with nothing, absolutely nothing and blank canvas, 
And maybe a few hours later or a day later, you've got this fantastic song. Even in its demo form, you know it's going to be it's just going to be a big song like like the Amazing Grace. You know, it was when we wrote that we just knew it was going to be a, just a great song with all the King's horses and all the King's men. Oh yeah, so catchy, so oh, great. You know, there's nothing like just cr- creating a great song from nothing. Mm-hmm. It's such a rush, man. I mean, I went to see um, Art Garfunkel. He did a little thing here in Franklin a couple of years ago. Love art. And he, and, and he took some he took some questions and I held my hand up, man. I knew exactly what I wanted to ask him. You know, people were asking him questions and he never chose me. But what I wanted to ask him is when you guys first got done with Bridge Over Troubled Water, did you know what you had? Mm. When you first heard the playback of that song in the studio, did you just did, did you know how huge that song was going to be? I just yeah. wanted to ask him that question. <laughs> yeah, that's a great one. I had the pleasure of meeting Art several years ago. I got a picture of him and I somewhere around here at Paul Simon that night as well. And yeah, Art is one of my favorite vocalists. I think uh, it's great. If, if you could hear an angel sing, I think they would sound like Art Garfunkel. <laughs> you know, he was with his son because his voice was, he was having some serious voice problems. Oh, I remember that period. Yeah, and he took some considerable time off the road because of that. Yeah. So he brought his son out with him and his son sounded just like him. It was really right. quite remarkable, but I mean, just coming up with a great song, man. Uh, can you imagine Paul Simon walking, walking into your house? Hey, I got this song, man. <laughs> it's called the boxer. Check it out. Oh man. man. Yeah. You know, uh, what do you think? Um, masterpiece. I can't say that I've ever written a masterpiece, but I mean, Paul Simon is one of my favorite writers, man. He's so prolific. He's so same here. I mean, he's so good. I, but I got mad when I went to see him live because he he had a new record. This was about three years or four years ago. He got a new record out, and he, he didn't play hardly any of his solo stuff from his older records. Really? We were waiting and waiting and waiting to hear, like, that, 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 yeah. you know, okay. right. some of that cool stuff, and he never did it. I, I've seen him live probably four or five times, and he's, he's kind of he's an interesting artist live because sometimes he – he almost uh, pushes back on some of his older stuff. Like Peter Satera is a friend of mine, and I've done some I've done uh, some gigs with Peter. And there, sometimes guys that are, you know, have left other bands, they would rather do their solo stuff, and it's you know, as opposed to the stuff that from the band that they were part of. I don't know why that is. I mean, I know several guys like that that were in big time bands. I mean, Bill Champlin's kind of the same way. Robert Plant's like that too. Yeah, it's another for a example. while he wouldn't play any Zeppelin stuff for his first few solo tours because he really wanted to. And, and oftentimes when he does, I've seen him solo live a few times. When he does, oftentimes he'll change the arrangement so it's still fresh. It's a little bit different. It's um, kind of disappointing because it's really what everybody wants to hear. Again. So you know, to circle back and to answer your question, I think that's, <clears throat> I think that hat is probably my favorite to wear. Well, that's probably when you're most creative. The job of a producer, it seems to be to really draw out everything you can from a song, from a band, from a singer, a musician. What is that like? And how does it differ in- internally for you than writing your own song? It's kind of hard because, you know, it's, it's kind of a push-pull thing. The artist might not like where you're taking it at first. And sometimes it takes a while for artists to say, you know what, man? I know, I know you pushed hard to change the arrangement on the song and, and to write in a new chorus. And at first I resisted it, but I think we made the right decision. And I really like, I really like it now a lot. So, you know, at first there's, everybody's got an ego, I mean, including me. And there's just that, you know, kind of that rub sometimes. I imagine it would take a good amount of trust. You know what, just, let's just try it. Let's just trust me here for a minute and we don't like it, we can go back. I mean, that's... You took the words out of my mouth. That's the line I always used. And it was true. Some, I mean, yeah. if you still hate it, we'll ditch it, you know, right. and go another direction. You and your brother form Astalon. And I think I think I got Lufcadio first. And for the longest time, I thought that was the first album until I saw, I'm like, wait a second, I've got this backwards. But I still love those albums that you guys did. And I didn't realize that Anthony Sally was playing bass with you guys back then. Obviously, those are some great albums. He played on Mastodon 3. Uh, the, the first two albums was, uh, it's a jungle out there. We used um, John Pierce, who's now with Huey Lewis. And a lot of people don't know that the guy that sang most of the stuff 
is Dave Amato, who's been in REO Speedwagon for 35 years. Really? See, yeah. I couldn't tell, Mike. I couldn't tell which ones were you. But man, what a voice. That guy's got some range on him. Holy smokes. Oh, he's great. Great guitar player. He played a lot of the guitar, too. Oh, really? Tony Palacios played a lot of guitar. Tony's so gifted. Yeah. Well, you guys went on to produce um, with Guardian, right? Yeah, I think you, you did Fire and Love. Did you do any work with him beyond that album? I think we did about three Guardian records. Okay. Uh, they were really fun. I saw that tour, um, uh, Fire and Love tour. I saw them at Downey, actually, in Downey. And, man, they were so good live. What I want to do is... They were, uh, they, were the, they were the first band on a Christian label that got on MTV. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was in heavy rotation back then. I remember those days. Um, Remember Headbangers Ball? Yeah. yeah. Let's listen to another cut from your new album. Let's play Time Machine. Uh, what can you tell us about the song and then we'll play it? Well, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is, is people might think I'm, I'm talking about like Back to the Future kind of time machine, which is not it at all. The, the time machine is kind of something that we all have. We all have this time machine in our head where we're, we're constantly looking back at either mistakes or good times or whatever. And we're constantly looking forward and worrying about the future. So we've got this little time machine going on in our head all the time. Interesting. And I think that God wants us to be content with where we're at today. Yeah. Not yesterday and not tomorrow. Because right, today is all we have right now. That's today right. is all we have right now. And we aren't promised tomorrow. You know, I mean, haven't you met people that, I mean, I do it myself. It's like, oh, remember that? And. I'm worried about next week, you know, this gig, if you have any, all the logistics right and mm-hmm. plane flights and ground transportation and backline. And, you know, we're constantly shifting that, that time machine is constantly wearing on our minds. You know what I mean? And I know people that completely live in the past. It's like, dude, I mean, I know that was fun, but join the world today. <laughs> Be in the now. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. Well, let's give a listen.
you had mentioned the, the Beatles influence in your early career. I can definitely hear some Beatles, particularly in the, the ending arrangement. Is that is that something that just kind of happens naturally as a writer and producer, or was that something that you were intentionally trying to, uh, you know, inject well, into that song? I know exactly what you're talking about, and it's it's not really in the in the way it's written musically. It's more in the instrumentation that you hear. Now, in, in the song, have you heard Stronger Now, the first single? I think I heard that one. I think that CCM, I think, released that one. Uh, yeah, we released one song. and Yeah, so that's a good song. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's one part of the song where I was working with Dave Cleveland, and, and I said, I hear kind of a George Harrison-type solo here, you know, harmonies, slide guitar, you know, that beautiful slide guitar that... Mm-hmm. Harrison and Clapton and those guys do. Yeah. And I kind of wanted a moment like that. And, but it works in the song very well. You know what I like about the songs that I've heard so far is that there's a diversity in the soundscape. I think that probably comes from your wide musical taste. I really appreciate that in an album where every song doesn't sound the same, but you, there's, there's a wide field of, of sound. Is that something you have to intentionally try to pursue or does it just happen as you're writing? I think it just kind of happens on its own. I mean, I don't, when I make a record, I don't plot out, okay, I want three songs like this. I want four songs like that. You know, it just, each song kind of takes on a life of its own. And like Time Machine, is, it's, it's a pretty rocking song. At first, I didn't intend it to rock that much, but it, I ended up deciding to go a different direction with that song because it was the last song that we wrote for the record. And oh, really? I told Frank, man, we, you know, we need to rock this thing up, man. Cause it, it, it's just, um, it's just asking for it. <laughs> yeah, that's a, it's an, it's a really good one. And so you're looking to possibly jump out on the road in, in support of this and any particular, are you maybe thinking of maybe the summer getting out on the road? There's nothing in the works as of yet. We're going to have a lot more focus on what we need to do. You had a, a, a young artist, somebody just starting on their musical journey, what, what advice might you give them? This is something I love to ask every, every artist I sit down with. The young budding artist, what's maybe something that you would share with them that could help them on their own journey? Work relentlessly hard. You know, um, write songs that people can relate to. I know that's not a great answer, but... No, I think that's... Well, I think so many artists think, you know, they see... I mean, I, 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 I personally worked relentlessly hard. It, it really helped me. I mean, I was... I was going nonstop you know, for many, and I'm, you know, I'm still going pretty hard. But I think sometimes, too, a lot of young artists see what's happening on American Idol and some of these other shows and think, oh, if I just get here, I'm going to break big and everything's my life's going to be forever changed and I'm going to be a huge star, where that's really, it's very rare. I can tell you what you're describing there. I'm going to be a huge star. I'm going to make a lot of money. I'm going to be famous. I can tell you right now that that part of it, in my opinion, that part is not what it's cracked up to be. I mean, making a lot of money and becoming famous isn't necessarily the funnest part of making it as an artist. Because, you know, the bigger you get, the more, the more you deal with. You know, this is a business. See, a lot of, and you asked me about, you know, a lot of young artists, they have to realize this, this is a business. Yes, it's, it's the music business. And you really realize that when you, when you get up the rungs on the ladder. Everything with record companies is always about money. And sometimes you're, you know, you don't get to release the single you want to release and you don't get to do this and that. So, you know, it's, I just think in general, fame is, 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 is kind of a lie because some of the most famous people that I've met are don't seem like the most happiest people. I, I've heard that before of others. I could see how that would be true because you get to, you know, your bank account to the size and you're still, if you're still empty inside, it's, it still feels the same. Yeah, it's, I, I think you hit it right on the head. It doesn't, those things that um, the world tells us we'll be happy then, we'll be, we'll be rich, we'll be famous, all, all, those, all those things will make us content. It's not true. Reminds me of, the, of that Petra song, Fool's Gold. I mean, that really, I think, sums that up perfectly. I think it's great to make it music and be successful. Like, there's a guy that comes to mind, a good friend of mine, um, there's a guy named Gary Tedder. Lives in Colorado Springs, and his son is Ryan Tedder with One Republic. Oh, okay, yeah. And Ryan's got such a balance in his life, man. I really admire that kid. Hmm. 
I mean, he's such a great songwriter. He's produced a McCartney record. Wow. He's written Beyonce songs, Taylor Swift songs. I mean, you name it. The guy's done it. Mm-hmm. He's just filthy talented, man. Mm-hmm. Just unbelievable. But he maintains this really, you know, maintains a, you know, a, a great marriage and, and a great, great father. He's a, he's a man of faith. And, and I just think that that guy's really got it together, man. As, as we approach the end of our time here, I've got some, uh, some rapid fire questions for you. So I'm just going to ask, I've got some questions to throw at you and see what, uh, see what you come up with here. So who's your favorite Beatle? McCartney. What might people be most surprised to find in your listening rotation? Smooth jazz. Nice. Okay. If you could produce only one more album for the rest of your life, what band or artist would you want to work with? Sting. He you doesn't mean- need me, though. <laughs> <laughs> it sure would be a blast, though. <laughs> if you could meet any artist who's passed away, who would it be and why? Oh, boy. Um, probably Kurt Cobain, because I'd just be curious what he was like as a person. Well, John, this has been a, it's been a real honor to chat with you today. And as I said at the top of our time together, uh, music you've been a part of in some fashion, playing, singing, producing, it's, it's been a part of my life, gosh, for over 30 years. And I'm so, so grateful for your contribution to my soundtrack of my own life. I really appreciate that. I want to encourage everybody to get John's new album, The Amazing Grace. You can check that. You can buy it on his website. Um, you can also check the tour dates at johnelefonte.com. That's J-O-H-N-E-L-E-F-A-N-T-E.com. I'll put that in the show notes. Um, John, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. It was fun. Awesome. Awesome. And thank you all for listening. I, uh, check out my new website, journeytothestage.com. You can leave a kind review if you've enjoyed my chat with John today. And I'll see you on our next Journey to the Stage. That's a wrap.